thank you everybody for coming out sort of virtually to see the talk. Today I'm going to be talking about the Admiral of the Cleveco. It's a actually very tragic story that happened right off the Cleveland coast. I think a lot of people actually may have even heard of it. A lot of the people involved in the incident, actually the families lived here in Cleveland. And so there's actually quite a few relatives in the area and maybe some online tonight, who knows. In any case, let's get started. The best place to start is probably um, the day that both those ships left port. Uh, that's December 1st, 1942. And uh, this is, there's no pictures of the, uh, the actual leaving of Toledo with the Cleveco under tow by the Admiral. Uh, but this is a good representative image of it. Uh, they left the Maumee River on that day and entered Lake Erie bound for Cleveland. The uh, harbor was cleared at around 2.45 p.m. in the afternoon. And despite the date, December, as we all know, is usually not a very pretty month, but uh, this was actually a beautiful day. Light southeast wind was blowing, uh, no storm warnings. Uh, by all indications, it was going to be a smooth and easy trip to Cleveland. And of course, the, year, the world had changed in the year leading up to this day. This was coming up on the first anniversary of December 7th, 1941, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, plunging uh, the U.S. into World War II. And of course, the Cleveco was loaded with one million gallons of number six fuel oil. Uh, this was now part of the war effort, and its job was to deliver this uh, needed war material to Cleveland for use in the war. So uh, it was not uh, inconsequential. And I should probably go back a little bit further than even the previous year, because it really starts with this tug right here. This is the tug W.H. Meyer. It was built in 1922 at the Manitowoc Shipyard in Wisconsin, and uh, it was launched and then delivered to Milwaukee, where it then spent 20 years working on Lake Michigan and Milwaukee as a harbor tug. Curiously, uh, this, this uh, ship actually, there was a previous W.H. Meyer built in the late 1800s, and it inherited the same equipment and engines and everything from that tug when they rebuilt the hull and built, uh, made, renamed it the exact same name as previous. So it operated for 20 years up until 1942. And at that point, a company named Cleveland Tankers came by and visited. They were interested in purchasing a tug and they focused in on the Meyer. Uh, you can actually see it right here on uh, a picture uh, on the side of the river in Milwaukee and they decided to buy it. And so they did. And then they, from there, they went ahead and moved it to Cleveland, Ohio. And the reason they moved it here to Cleveland is they needed a tug in order to be able to tow their tank barge, Cleveco. And the Cleveco uh, was uh, in need of a tug, and this fit the bill. Unfortunately, some modifications are gonna be needed. This was a harbor tug. It wasn't really made for 24 hour, three shift type operations in open water. And so what they did is they started a program to extensively modify it. Uh, here's another view of the Meyer uh, in Milwaukee. And you can see that this is a good profile shot of it. And what they did was, is they actually cut away the wheelhouse, raised it, moved it forward, and added additional quarters both behind it and below it. Uh, this was to make room for the additional crew. They were gonna go with a, a three watch, 13 crew system. And so it entered the dry docks in Henderson or J.A. Henderson dry docks, and they started the rebuilding process. Now, in addition to that, they added shower and washroom. They went ahead and reconstructed the mess room, and then they uh, raised the smokestack, and they added refrigeration and safety equipment as well, uh, because now it needed to provide food, a galley. Um, they were going to be uh, uh, on the water for days at a time, and therefore they needed to do all this. And in the end, what you ended up with was a very different vessel than the Meyer. In fact, this is what it looked like. This is the Tug Admiral right after it uh, left dry dock and entered service. Uh, you can see it's a very, very different looking ship. In fact, you wouldn't even recognize it as the same uh, vessel. Uh, you can see the cabin is certainly raised and forward. Uh, the bridge is now on the second level more than on the first level. And it actually uh, left and entered temporary certificate service on July 23rd of that year. Um, the Coast Guard had not yet finished its evaluation, and so therefore it did not really receive its official certification letter until September of 1942. Uh, the uh, certificate actually raised a lot of questions, which became important later. Uh, one of those questions was this became a much bigger vessel. It increased it by almost 20,000 pounds, 
and it raised the center of gravity. And there was a lot of concerns about the Admiral's stability. Uh, it was now grossing 130 ton tons, 93 feet long, 22 feet wide. And uh, in fact, when it entered service, it immediately did experience some problems with stability. There was an incident on the Detroit River where it made a hard turn with uh, the Gleefco under tow, and it almost overturned. Uh, water actually came in over the aft deck. So there were a lot of additional concerns on that. The Klebco is pictured here, and it was built in 1913 in American shipyards right here in Lorraine, Ohio. And of course, this is a much bigger vessel. This is a 250 foot long, uh, 2,400 ton tanker barge, which means it carries liquids. And it was launched actually not as the Klebco, but the SO Company number 85. Because they're very good at imaginative names there. And uh, when it was bought by Cleveland Tankers in September of 1940, they renamed it the Cleveco. And so with the purchase of the Meyer and the transition of it into the Admiral, they now had a tug tanker combination that could make regular runs uh, hauling fuel oil uh, between Cleveland and uh, Toledo and other places too. So let's get back to December 1st, 1942. Uh, the ship left Toledo and uh, made its way around through the Western Basin, taking the North Passage, Pelee Passage, headed then down to Cleveland. And like I said, it was actually a very nice day. It didn't seem too bad. But as they traveled along, the wind started to pick up, temperatures started to drop, and things started to get a little dicey, uh, more typical December weather, as, as you would probably expect. And by the time they got to the Pelee Passage, temperatures were now below freezing and the uh, temperature had actually dropped dramatically, and the winds were picking up. So here's a uh, artist rendition of the uh, Admiral and Cleveco under tow. By the time of the Peely Passage, they were pretty much at a full winter gale, much more typical of the December weather. Temperatures around 25 degrees, icing, large seas, snow squalls, the whole bit. They went from a very nice day to a pretty nasty day. And what they did is they continued on. They continued uh, through the night, uh, headed toward Cleveland, Ohio. And then of course, at the height of the storm or the good portion of it, four in the morning, um, the Cleveco actually had a ship to shore telephone. And uh, the Admiral had no radio communications at all. Uh, most ships at the time didn't, but a larger ship like the Cleveco was actually fitted with radio communications. And at four in the morning, Captain William Smith actually contacted the shore. And he called Captain Leif Johnson, uh, the Marine Superintendent for Cleveland Tankers. And as you might gather, at four in the morning, there's no such thing as a nice, how are you doing phone call. And in fact, that's exactly what was. He reported to Johansson that the uh, Admiral had been running five to six points off his starboard bow rather than straight ahead of him when it suddenly disappeared. Now, that's pretty disturbing. The Admiral disappearing really meant only one thing, and that is, is that the ship had most likely sunk. Uh, in fact, he reported that he couldn't see any survivors, and as far as he could tell, it was presumably till, still tied to the sunken tug. Um, and uh, meanwhile, the storm continues to build, and that's not a very good situation to find yourself in. So one of the big questions always have been, what happened to the Admiral? It sank very suddenly with no warning, no indications, and there was a lot of speculation both during and after the incident about what exactly happened. Uh, the early speculation was that it rolled and capsized from the instability. Like I mentioned, the initial certification actually specified that it had to tow its loads completely astern, could not be off. And in this case, it was five to six points off. Uh, that actually could have caused the, the Admiral to roll. Uh, however, divers actually did find the wreck in 1981. And what they found was, is in fact, there was, uh, it was upright on the bottom and there was absolutely no indications of a roll. They found tool chests inside uh, with the tools still nicely placed in, no furniture thrown around like you would expect if something rolled. Everything seemed to be in place and the ship was sitting upright on the bottom. So rolling actually never happened, even though there was actually a court case that decided that's what happened. In any case then, it, there's a lot of other possibilities of what could have gone wrong. One of them was that extreme tow angle. It was known that Cleveco was having steering problems. Captain Smith had actually mentioned that at one point. And it was also known that the uh, Cleveco had a, a fairly undersized rudder. So maybe that uh, 
actually could have started to pull the admiral in the wrong direction, even pull it stern back, causing water to come in over the aft deck. And anybody that knows tugs knows that when water comes in over the aft deck, that big engine and that very little freeboard, they go down very quickly. And that's a possibility. You know the possibilities? They, they actually uh, fouled the hauser in the prop. Uh, that would have pulled the tug backwards and also probably caused the stern to go into water. There's a third possibility, and actually it's the one I kind of favor, and that is the fact that they were in icing conditions. Uh, ice was beginning to accumulate on the deck, and it may have just weighted down the tug so much that the stern just slipped underwater and immediately it went down. Part of the evidence that supports that is the divers, when they first stove it, found black steam hoses and an axe on the deck. And that would, of course, been used to clear ice. Furthermore, two crew members were recovered uh, right after the incident, uh, within uh, days or weeks. The bodies of two of the crew, the second mate and a fireman, came ashore. That means they were most likely out on the deck. And given what divers found later, they were probably trying to clear the ice when the ship suddenly decided to just sink, taking them and washing them overboard and everybody else sealed up inside from the winter storm being taken down with the vessel. However, we'll never really know exactly what happened. Meanwhile, of course, the Cleveco now finds itself tied to a sunken vessel in a building storm. He reported to Captain Johansson that he was probably about two miles off Avon Point. He said, that's great, sit tight. He hung up and immediately called the Coast Guard and the Great Lakes Towing Company for assistance so that they would launch and try to help the Cleveco. Uh, he then actually got in his car, picked up a clerk that worked for American Tanker, as well as the Great Lakes Towing Company's manager, and they all piled in and drove over to go look for the Cleveco. And from Cleveland, this is the uh, US Coast Cutter card cutter uh, that launched, the Ossipi. It immediately set sail uh, underway in steam. And uh, simultaneously, the tugs California and Pennsylvania from the Great Lakes Towing Company launched from both Lorraine and Cleveland, all converging on Avon Point to assist the Cleveco. So there's two miles off of Avon Point, just to kind of give you a scale of reference. And when the uh, Captain uh, Johnson got out there, he couldn't find him, couldn't see him anywhere at all. So he called, they actually drove back to his house. He got on the phone and asked him, so uh, we can't see you out there. And so Captain Smith refined his position saying, actually, I'm a little further offshore, maybe 10 miles offshore. Uh, so that's probably why they didn't see them. Simultaneously, he reported every other board is fine. They were not very happy about the uh, Admiral and the crew that was aboard that uh, vessel. But at the same time, everything else seemed to be okay. He uh, also reported seeing a tug approaching from a stern, and that was great news. That means one of the Great Lakes Towing Company tugs had found him, either the California or the Pennsylvania. And Captain Johansson said, okay, great, get underway, get a tow, and I will see you in Cleveland, and hung up with him. And this is the tug, or one of the tugs that would have uh, been there. This is the classic Great Lakes Towing Company uh, tug. Uh, up until recently, they were still active. Now less so, uh, most of them have been scrapped. But this vessel is over 100 years old, or this type of vessel is over 100 years old. And really the workhorse of a lot of the harbors in Cleveland, Avon, Lorraine, all those places. In any case, he also picked up the phone and called the Civil Air Patrol just to keep track of the barges uh, progress. Now this is a Piper Cub. Uh, it's a very lightweight uh, airplane, but this is what the Air Patrol actually used uh, at that time. And of course, not exactly the perfect plane to actually be flying in a storm, especially one like this. Nevertheless, they did launch and they went looking for the barge. At 1130, the Coast Guard uh, called Captain Johnson and said, uh, by the way, there's no sign of the Cleaveco. The Coast Guard, the uh, um, cutter had not found it and both tugs had returned to port with no tows. So he gets back on the phone again, calls Captain Smith. And Captain Smith reports that yes, the tug didn't see him. Uh, they could see the tug, but the tug couldn't see him, most likely due to a heavy Arctic mist. But what that means is, is that there was a fine mist close to the lake surface. The tug was inside it and unable to see anything outside, but the cleave coat being larger and higher could see down into the mist and see the tug. So the tug probably went 
pretty close right by them by within a mile or so, but never knew they were that close to the leaf go. Uh, at noon, Captain Smith reports cutting loose from the sunken admiral to be able to drop his anchor, second anchor without fouling. He'd already dropped one anchor just so uh, he wouldn't drift, and he decided he'd go ahead and drift, uh, drop the second one. But to keep from fouling, he cut himself loose. And maybe in hindsight, that wasn't the best thing to do. Um, he also was able to see landmarks now. So he started to give bearings to typical landmarks that uh, they could see. And by plotting that, showed he was probably about 10 miles off of Cleveland. Uh, just to the west. So at least they had a position and uh, that was passed on to the Coast Guard and the Civil Air Patrol. And in, at one point, Captain Smith reported seeing an airplane or hearing an airplane and they actually got a sight of it. But it's not sure whether the airplane actually saw them or not. And the fog and the snow squalls were getting worse. So at two o'clock, the Ossipi actually sights the Cleveco and approaches an attempt to tow. Uh, Captain Smith reports it's now very cold, 15 degrees Fahrenheit, violent snow squalls, big seas, strong wind. It's getting worse, not better. And, uh, but he reports everybody's fine and nobody wanted to be removed, which is, again, probably something in hindsight that wasn't a good idea. The crew was safe and warm inside the vessel. There was no danger and nobody wanted to risk actually climbing out on uh, trying to transfer between two vessels in a raging storm with all the snow and ice. In fact, that ice was a big problem. Heavy ice was beginning to form on the barge and they didn't think they could connect a tow line. So the Asipi actually just stood off waiting for further directions, any assistance that they could render. Three o'clock, the Asipi suddenly loses sight of the Cleave Go. A snow squall comes in and visibility goes to nothing and the Cleave Go just disappeared into the mist. Now you have to understand this is before ships were commonly fitted with radar. So the only way to find each other was by visible uh, sightings. Once the Mississippi lost sight of the Cleveco, they lost it permanently. There were also reports by then that from the Coast Guard cutter that the seas were very large, very strong wind, and now Captain Smith requested that the crew be taken off the barge. Unfortunately, the Mississippi couldn't find them. At 3.30, Captain Smith reported water coming in and the power would go out if it reached the generator, which would of course kill the uh, radio telephone. And in fact, that must have happened because that was the last transmission from the Cleveco. At 4.40 p.m., the Ossipi tries to contact the Cleveco and gets no response. At this point, they probably have already sunk him. And so by then, seas are 10 to 15 feet, wind 60 with gusts to 70 miles an hour. It's too horrible to be out there anymore. And with darkness coming, there's nothing more the SFP can do. So it decides to head back to, to Cleveland where they try to get the ice off of the vessel and get ready to go out first light in the morning. And that's what they do. The next morning they uh, brought up steam, headed out and went looking for the Cleave Co. Unfortunately, they did not find the Cleave Co. Uh, they did find an oil slick, which they then followed and it led them pretty much to the sunken barge four miles off of Euclid. The anchors had obviously dragged. The vessel had traveled from the west of Cleveland all the way past Cleveland and was now east of Cleveland before finally sinking. And of course, disturbingly, bodies and debris were found in the water scattered all over the area. Uh, this is one of the vessels that actually joined in the search and the recovery of everything that they could find. This is the tender crocus. It uh, actually recovered most of the bodies. The uh, story would have ended there, except for the fact that in 1961, the Coast Guard finally led a contract to raise the Cleveco. It had been sitting there all through World War II uh, with the oil still inside, slowly leaking out, and then all the way through the 1950s, and it wasn't until 61, inexplicably, that a contract was finally let to raise it, pump it out, and then scrap the uh, Cleveco. So this is the Cleveco raised, uh, it was actually issued to North American Marine Salvage in Bordentown, New Jersey, not to a local contractor. It, for whatever reason, went to somebody from outside the region. And uh, this company uh, was owned by J.R. King and Harry Doan. You can actually tell that that's them uh, because if you look on the side of the hall there, you can actually see once they raised the Cleveco, they actually put their names on it, which is a little weird, but nevertheless, that's what they did. July 18th, 1961, uh, the hull of the Cleveco finally broke the surface 
And at that point, the salvage operation began. Now, the contract explicitly said they were to pump all of the oil out and then tow the vessel ashore, bring it ground, and then cut it down and sell it for scrap. Uh, but that didn't happen. For whatever reason, uh, they started pumping oil, and you can actually see the salvage ship here with the hose connected to the hull, pumping the oil out. And after just a day, they claimed that they had emptied all the oil out of it. And they thought, instead of actually towing it ashore, how about we just take it out in deeper water and sink it? Now, that's not what the contract called for, but nevertheless, that's what they decided to do. And inexplicably, again, the Coast Guard went along with it. Uh, they, they, uh, it actually saved the company a lot of money. They still get paid the full amount, but they ended up taking a shortcut. So they took it off of Fairport and sank it in about 75 feet of water. Uh, so it would no longer be a hazard to navigation. The oil had been removed, and so that would have been the end of the story. Except for one other problem, and that is in 1995, it began leaking again. Uh, some people may even remember this. It took the Coast Guard a while to find it. They had lost uh, where exactly it was. And local divers actually had to tell them where to find it. Once they let another contract, uh, which this time didn't take 20 years to let, um, they finally, they did not raise it. They left it on the bottom. They put a bunch of valves along the keel because it was upside down. And uh, they pumped down an additional 165,000 gallons of oil, uh, which shows that the original salvage company did not do a very good job. Uh, they'd really cut a lot of corners and uh, really kind of shortcutted the whole process. The uh, hole is still out there today, upside down off of Fairport. And now finally it's free of all the oil, so it's no longer an environmental hazard. The Admiral remained missing for a good long time after that. In fact, it was one of the big mysteries is where was the Admiral? Uh, a lot of people looked for it. They uh, did look for it right after it sank, in fact dragging wires back and forth, hoping to snag it. Uh, nobody ever did until finally in 1981, it was located and divers found it sitting upright on the bottom, as I described. When they entered inside, they started to find remains of the crew, uh, the ones that had been sealed up inside the ship. Uh, they notified the Coast Guard, the coroner, a lot of discussions were held. And for legal reasons, it was decided it was best rather than try to raise all the bodies and things like that. That, and by this time they were very disarticulated, that they would instead just remove, the divers would remove them off to the side and bury them somewhere in a nondescript location. So that's exactly what they did. Uh, so they're still there with their ship today. And uh, on Friday, September 11th, 1981, uh, the Coast Guard Cutter Nea Bay went out and held a memorial service over the wreck site with uh, the uh, survivors aboard the uh, vessel. Uh, they did a leaf, uh, a reef laying. Uh, there were 25 uh, relatives aboard and uh, kind of finally brought closure, I think, to a lot of the uh, surviving family members of the crew of the Admiral. So that was uh, a very nice thing to be able to do because uh, up until that point, their final resting location had not even been known. And I should really mention, show actually who was aboard. Uh, this is 14 people that were listed on the manifest. All of them went down with the ship. There were no survivors on either vessel. And so you have to remember when you talk about shipwrecks, you're really, of course, talking about the fact that it's a human tragedy. In this case, it's an extreme tragedy because it was two vessels and there were no survivors among either vessel. It must have been a, a pretty horrible experience. Um, and in fact, it wasn't 14 people on the Admiral. So there was an additional person. Um, Jim Paskert, uh, the chief researcher of the Cleveland Underwater Explorers, actually dug this one up. Uh, there was an additional fireman aboard named Michael Joyce. And what had happened was he had missed the Admiral sailing from Cleveland to go pick up the Clevco in Toledo. And so what happened was, is he got in the car with a relative, I believe his sister or female, uh, aunt, and she drove him to Toledo and he was last seen getting aboard the Admiral before it set sail uh, and, and uh, come back to Cleveland with the Clevco in tail. So, he kind of gets overlooked, but nobody's ever contested that he wasn't aboard. The court case afterwards, actually, they accepted him. Nobody contested that he wasn't there. So there aren't 14 people aboard. There was 15. And then, of course, two bodies were recovered, like I'd mentioned earlier, uh, probably the two out on deck clearing the ice. And then aboard the Clevco is an additional 18 people. Um, this is their names here. 
Captain Smith, and then uh, first mate was Edwin Smith. I believe they were related. And uh, out of that, only a few of the bodies were recovered, about eight of them actually, to be uh, completely exactly correct. And uh, in the end, this is the number of people that died in, in the, uh, the tragedy of the Admiral and the Cleveco. 33 people total, of course, all their families and things like that. Uh, missed them after that. And so that kind of ends the story. Both are still out there. Uh, they are dive sites today. Both are uh, uh, actually very nice to dive. And knowing the story now about them, you actually appreciate what you see. So that's really all I had. Um, thank you for listening. And I guess if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Yeah, there's a couple from the chats that I'm going to pass along. And then if people want to jump in uh, and unmute themselves, we can do that too. April came in with a question. Is this back before the times when ships could communicate between each other? Uh, because between lifeboats and doing that, how could the Admiral, why wouldn't, why wouldn't there be any survivors from, I'm guessing, the Admiral or the, or, or the other? Uh, yeah. Uh, so radio was actually relatively new in the Great Lakes. Um, it was not required that any, every vessel have radios like today. Radio had been invented earlier, and they were very common on ocean-going vessels, especially after the Titanic, where it was mandated that everybody have a radio and have it on 24 hours a day and man 24 hours a day. But that rule did not apply to the Great Lakes. It's uh, inland waters, and different rules apply. So the Admiral had no radio, um, no way of communicating except for by line of sight to the Cleve Co. It was towed. Now, the Clevco did have a radio. That's, you know, the telegraph, the radio, telephone, radio telephone aboard. And so it was able to talk to shore, the, sh the shipmaster there, the superintendent. But uh, for the most part, uh, a lot of vessels on the Great Lakes didn't have it. And even if, if the Admiral had a radio, I'm not so sure it would have helped in any way because it went down so suddenly that I don't think they would have even had time to think. Um, now, we know what happened on the Clevco, even though there's no survivors, because they kept talking to them. And through an entire 24-hour period until it sank the next day, uh, or late in the afternoon of that first day, we, we were able to, they were able to talk, find out what was happening, know the water's coming in. Um, but unfortunately, this is also the time for GPS. And when you can't see very well, and everything is line of sight navigation, you don't know where you are in the lake. Uh, the only time a position was ever found was when he was able to see shore well enough to get a position fixed on a couple of landmarks and the bearings. And from that, they could triangulate his position. At that point, they knew he was 10 miles off of Cleveland and slightly west. But that's about it. We take GPS for granted, but that's a relatively new phenomena. And uh, knowing where you were and being able to talk to the outside world wasn't always possible. And uh, even as late as World War II, that was pretty common. And knowing, you know, just in terms of the Admiral going down quite quickly, the water was very cold too. So how long would you have given the sort of hypothermia before you would yeah. stumble that? So the, remember it was four in the morning. So it was going to be very dark. And the two people on the Admiral's deck probably survived the initial sinking but you have minutes in that sort of temperature. I don't know what the water temperature actually was, but it was probably between 32 and 35 degrees, maybe a little higher, 38. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, your amount of time in the water like that's going to be measured in minutes before you start to slow down, you just kind of go to sleep and uh, your muscles freeze up. Uh, as a diver, I wear dry suits in that sort of water. And even then, it feels like when you first jump in, a thousand little needles all punching you simultaneously. And that's with a dry suit where the water's not even touching my body except for my face and hands. So I can imagine what it's like to go in in just street clothes. Uh, you don't have very long. And then at four in the morning, the Clevco never would have been able to see anybody anyway, especially in the big seas that they were in. So um, I'm sure it was over fairly quickly for anybody that ended up in the water from either vessel throughout the day as both vessels sank. Uh, there's a second, there's a, the next thing in the chat is, um, this is Elsa Hannon Shepard, Hannon and Shepard. My father was Harold Hannon. His body drifted to Conneaut where it was caught in fishnets. Okay. Yeah. That was one of the two crewmen on the deck of the Admiral. And uh, I believe he was the second mate, if I'm not mistaken. 
Yeah, but I'm sorry to hear that. It's quite tragic to have happened. Thank you. I was only two years old, she continues. Uh, it's only memories. My only memories were what my sisters, my mom told me. Uh, she has some pictures too, she says. Uh, hmm. let's see. Further question from Michelle Hack. What would have happened if the Klebko had remained tethered to a sunken ship? So I think it would have turned out better. Um, the problem is, is that its anchors dragged all the way across. By being tied to the, the Admiral, I think they would have stayed in one spot and they would have been found eventually by the tugs or the Ossipi. And at that point, they'd be in a lot better position than trying to find a drifting vessel in snowstorms or visibility. Uh, I think, in fact, the Klebko probably could have been saved had it remained tied to the Admiral. But for whatever reason, Captain Smith decided to cut them loose and rely on his anchors instead. And in hindsight, that did not work out very well. Ray Danner uh, from the chat stream says, uh, for the divers in the audience, what are these sites like? I know the Admiral has a mooring ball, does the Klebko? Klebko does not. Um, it's not what we would call an interesting dive in the sense that it is an upside down hull. It's a turtle, as they say. So it's mostly just uh, the bottom of a ship with uh, the valves that they use to pump out the oil the second time down the keel. I think there's like three to six valves, something like that. Uh, so there's not much to see there, but the, uh, the Admiral is upright on the bottom. Uh, it's still standing high today. The uh, portholes and the doors are all open. So you can actually stick your head inside and look around a little bit. Uh, there is some silt uh, that's filled up the interior, especially the lower spaces. But otherwise, it's sitting like it's sailing on the surface. It's just now sitting on the bottom. And uh, it's, a, it's quite a popular site, partly because of the history. Shipwrecks really are history. It's, it's nice to see, you know, shipwrecks. But without knowing a story, like an unidentified shipwreck, you lose a lot of the experience. And so the Admiral has so much history behind it that you really fully appreciate what you're seeing when you do dive it. And you're, you have to be respectful. I mean, people died on this vessel. It's sort of like going to a Civil War battlefield. You know people died there. And, and I think it's really important to actually keep access to these sites simply because that allows you to remember, remember what happened. Uh, just like people go to battlefield sites and things like that, to remember the history. So uh, um, it, it's kind of a moving experience. Um, and you kind of see a, a vessel that they don't really make them like that anymore. Tugs look very different than the ones that they build. And uh, um, you get to remember what happened. And even the Clevco, even though it's not an interesting site, you, you get to remember what happened. Amy Guild asks in the chat, are there any memorial plaques along the shore to where the body surfaced in Cleveland or in Euclid? Not that I'm aware of, no. Uh, I've never heard of that. Not to say that they don't exist, but I, I certainly haven't seen any myself. That'd actually be a nice idea, though. Again, yeah. bringing the history alive. Yeah, this doesn't, I mean, this is, I'll, I'll just say as, you know, uh, someone who knows a certain amount about the local area just from having done a certain amount of historical research, this is an interesting story and news to me, but it doesn't, you know, uh, how does this stack up in terms of like the famous wrecks of, you know, Lake Erie, and, and the lakes generally, like if you ask anyone in sort of other part of the United States about wrecks on the Great Lakes, they can come up probably with the Edmund Fitzgerald and that's it. Um, yep. but, but sort of say, you know, among, among Lake Erie wrecks, do you, do you think this is less well known than some, some other ones or? Um, you know, it's mostly recent still. I mean, there are relatives alive that remember the people aboard the ships or nearly so. And so because it's so close in memory, um, I think it's a little bit more remembered than say ships that sank in the 1800s where pretty much anybody that knew anybody on the ship is gone. And that's actually one reason why the Fitzgerald is still in modern history so well is simply because that's one of the most recent ones. And so it's still very, most people remember the ship going down. And uh, even if they didn't have relatives aboard or know anybody aboard. And so as time goes on, memories tend to fade. And I, I think the Admiral and the Clevco actually are still relatively well remembered in Cleveland, at least from people that had some sort of involvement with it. Uh, had heard about it through you know, family lore 
or, uh, or, or divers, um, you know, that are familiar with the local history. Yeah, this is, you know, as someone who comes from another part of the country, one of the really interesting things about this, about this area and one of the sort of real um, cultural uh, heritage things that, that people have around here is this sort of culture of the lakes. Like you're, you're around this, this sort of these enormous bodies of water that have been, you know, avenues of travel and trade and uh, have, this, have this incredible history that people outside and the rest of the country don't know about, but it's just, you know, really, really fascinating. I will say, so there's another comment from Elsa who was, who was asking earlier, and I think she's asking about the, the possibility of uh, uh, evacuating the, the sailors from the, from the Klebko. Wouldn't they have been warmer in, in lifeboats? Uh, or, I mean, I think, she's, I think what she's really getting at is like, why did they not try and get them off the, off the boat given, given what the circumstances were? Yeah, um, unfortunately, Captain Smith, and I assume he consulted with some of his crew at least, didn't want to leave the ship. Um, at the time, they were still safe. They were drifting and, you know, the anchors were dragging and the Ossipi was nearby and nobody really wanted to leave the ship. Um, I mean, it was cold. It's 15 degrees out. It's icing, snowing, blowing. There is some danger and hazard trying to transfer between two ships under those sort of circumstances. And so I think a lot of the crew and Captain Smith said, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, we'll just stay here. Uh, keep an eye on us, but we'll stay here. By the time things got so bad and water started coming in, at that point, they wanted off the ship. But by then, the Ossipi had lost sight of them. And like I said earlier, without radar, they can't find each other. If you can't see them, you can't find them. And with darkness coming, it was four in the afternoon. Um, it was kind of late in the day, um, storm is getting worse, and now the ice coverage is so bad that even trying to launch a, a lifeboat was probably impossible. It's probably frozen in place. So uh, getting off the ship was, at that point, impossible. And uh, even if they could launch a lifeboat, the, they're in a tiny boat in a big storm, and I don't know if your chances of survival are very that good either. So. So unfortunately, they, they waited too long. Uh, they should have taken up the Asipi's offer to evacuate them the first time rather than sit it out in the lake. Again, hindsight, you know, kind of quarterbacking on a Monday morning there, but nevertheless, they kind of missed their chance. Right, yeah. That's, I mean, it's one of those things where in a bad situation, you know, you have to kind of try and make a guess about what the best thing to do is, and, and it's, it's easy to guess wrong. Um, one of the one of the commenters relating to something I said earlier is that the Fitz is more well known because of the Gordon Lightfoot song. That's yeah. really true. Actually, that's very true. Um, um, if they had a song about the Admiral Cleveco. I think a lot more people would remember it. I have a question though about why was the like was the was the Cleveco not able to proceed under its own power? Why was it being tugged? Oh, so you know, one thing is everybody looks at it and thinks that's a ship. It had no engine. It was a barge. We don't build barges like that anymore, um, you know, in the sense that it looks like a ship just missing the engine. It, but it, it actually couldn't do anything. It was not self-propelled. Uh, the tug was its sole means of propulsion. And so uh, um, nowadays we would do things differently. I mean, barges don't look like that. Uh, but nevertheless, um, yeah, it, it was completely dependent on the Admiral to get around. Were there any lighthouses in the area that might have helped with sighting? No, actually not really. The Cleveland light, you know, is really it. It's relatively low on the water. Uh, you'd be better off from one of the buildings in downtown seeing it. Um, but you also have to remember this is the 1940s. The skyline looks very different than it does now. And they were far enough offshore that I don't think anybody could really see them. They were 10 plus miles offshore, uh, right up to close to the end. Uh, when the Cleveco finally sank about four miles offshore. Um, the Admiral, by the way, is around 14 miles out of Rocky River uh, is where it ended up. Um, and so even on a clear day in the summer, if you put a big ship out there, you might be able to see it. But with all the snow and the squalls and the storm, very unlikely, and that Arctic mist that they talked about, very unlikely that, that anybody could have seen or helped them or fixed their position. 
Uh, like I said, even the Klevko only was able to fix their position one time. Another question from the chat is, did they have navigational lights? I assume on land, and yeah, they do. But uh, again- On, on the ships the themselves, do you think they did? Or did they, I mean, you probably know. Oh, they did. Uh, all, all ships had to carry lights and they have since the 1800s because uh, ships tend to run into each other at night. Um, they, they have uncanny ability to do that. Uh, I've never really understood it. You could be out in the middle of a wide open lake. There's only two vessels and they always seem to be on a collision course. Um, I don't know why that happens, but so all vessels have to be lit. And, and even in the 1800s, they had to carry lanterns constantly lit and then eventually electric lights took over. So yeah, they definitely had navigation lights and things like that, but they're not like modern Lakers. Uh, you see a modern Laker out there, it looks like a Christmas tree going by. These vessels were not lit like that. Um, they had the mandatory um, lights aboard, but probably no more. Um, that's a more modern thing. Uh, there's another question. With the instability, Admiral, why did they never try to fix the problem? So the uh, Admiral actually only lived for about six months. I mean, it was launched in July 23rd of 1942 and December 3rd, it sank. Um, the uh, Coast Guard certified it too, uh, with limitations. You know, they had to have its tow uh, straight aft. It couldn't be at an angle. It couldn't be at the 45 to 55 degree angle that the Cleveco said it was at when it disappeared. Um, but uh, that was actually the main point of the, the uh, court trial or the court testimony afterwards was, was the Admiral unstable? Why was it certified? Why were all the restrictions placed on the certificate? And then in the end, uh, was that the cause of its loss? And uh, the court ultimately ruled that yes, that was the cause of the loss. And therefore the families were entitled to, because of the negligence of uh, both the uh, uh, the dry dock, as well as American Tanker, who specified what it should be built as. Uh, they had to pay out uh, money to the surviving families. Uh, so that actually happened after World War II. Uh, and the court testimony is actually where a lot of the information comes from about what happened, um, uh, what the condition of the vessel was, all that stuff. So uh, it's a great resource, actually, the, the testimony and the summary of the testimony in the appeals as well. Do you think that part of the problem was deficiencies in terms of the of the meteorological data that they had access to? So if they had known what kind of storm was likely to blow up, do you think that they would have maybe delayed the sailing or would that not have been a consideration? So maybe, maybe not. Actually, one of the big changes after the fit sank was in 1940s, we didn't have as good a weather forecasting as we did in the 1970s when the fit sank. Nevertheless, there was a lot of pressure by companies to go set sail on schedule, regardless of the weather. Uh, the captain, in fact, did not really have much of an opportunity to say, no, we're not going out. The company uh, businessmen would say, no, you're going out, and he would have to go. So even if they had had better weather forecasting information, given the fact that a war was on, uh, this is war material needs to be delivered. Uh, the fact that the company needs to make money and remain on time with its deliveries. I think that even if they had known what was coming, they still would have set sail because that was still true when the Fitzgerald set sail. They knew that storm was coming. Maybe not, it wasn't going to be that bad, but they knew it was coming and they still sailed anyway, along with the Arthur Anderson and half a dozen other ships. So, um, and it was after that sinking that um, finally, it was ruled that captains can say no, and that they started to tell uh, businesses that you can't just tell your ship to sail regardless. Uh, the captain has the final say. That's actually not something that was really true before the fit sank. That was one of the things that came out of it, the changes they made in the industry. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting thing that, I mean, it's one thing that, you know, your point about the, your point about the Klebko is really well taken. This is warm material. Uh, it's a sort of an exigent situation almost that, that would trump the weather. The Fitz is carrying 50,000 tons of taconite, I think, or something, something yeah. along those lines, which is a lot harder to justify lives being lost in the name of shifting that between here and, or between, you know, Wisconsin and, and Detroit. Um, 
but yeah, that's a really interesting, that's a really interesting thing, you know, uh, to, you know, that, that you wouldn't, you would have thought that the, the captains would have had more say, but I, you know, that's in, in a way, it doesn't surprise me that they didn't. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, the dollar always wins. Well, very often, yeah, you're very often true. It's very often true. Uh, all right. I want to thank Kevin for this really fascinating presentation. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you.